Yo, those of you who've come to the public inquest, uh, public inqu uh, inquiries and inquest session, you already know me. My name's Angela Patrick. I'm Justice's Director of Human Rights Policy. Now, this slot is bloody hard. We're, we're told we've got an hour, and whenever you do it, you're supposed to give a flavour of the human rights year. Now, I only can speak for 40 minutes, so it's going to be a really quick taste. Uh, so I hope you can grab the flavour quickly. Um, Mostly what I'm going to talk about in the 40 minutes is what justice has been doing, a little bit about what we think are some of the key human rights cases of the last 12 months, and a little bit of a look forward at some of the challenges for 2015. You'd have to be blind not to think that there were a few out there. Um, but first, since it's three o'clock and we've just had a coffee, we might start with, a, you know, start with a little gentle introduction into the last 12 months. It's been a big year for Dominic Grieve, hasn't it? He's been everywhere! But he has been a bit of a hero, responding to the Conservative proposals that we get rid of the Human Rights Act and the ECHR. Every time we read that we're going to be on the same platform as Dominic, you're kind of thinking, well, I'll just have to say, I agree with Dominic. And then sit down again. In fact, it was such a big year for Dominic, he was so proud, he joined the Justice Council. Um, now, the reason we've got this up here is that I'm sure quite a few of you in the room, if you'd agreed with some of Dominic's views on the um, uh, HRA proposals and the ECHR um, setback, would agree with Adam Wagner when hearing um, Dominic on the Today programme responding to the Conservative Party paper said, who's up for starting a Kickstarter? We're going to have a Dominic Grieve action figure. 18, sorry, 8 99 or 11 99 with wig and gown. <laughs> no wig and gown this time, but that's the most amusing action man that I could find. Now, let's start with we're going to do a little bit of a have I got news for you style odd one out round. I apologise to anybody who hasn't seen Have I Got News for You. Okay. <laughs> right, anybody? Who's that? Oh God, it's Abu Qatada. You can't talk about human rights without talking about <laughs> Abu Qatada. <laughs> anybody? That's a prisoner voting. <laughs> It's a cat, yeah. <laughs> and have you got a, what, what's the odd one out? You, who said you get? Oh, you get the chocolate, but I'm not throwing them because I think I might get health and safety in here. And um, of course, Abu Qatada, prisoners voting, and cats, all mentioned in the Conservative Party uh, rationale for its new strategy paper. You kept not so much. Um, but UKIP would support, and have, I've said publicly before they've published their manifesto, that yes, they too would repeal the Human Rights Act and withdraw us from our connection to the European Convention on Human Rights. So not necessarily that odd. Um, I don't know. Um, so let's get on. I'm supposed to tell you about the Human Rights <coughs> Year. And the best way I thought I could tell you about our Human Rights Year at Justice was talk about how we work as an organisation. A number of you are members of Justice, and I hope that by the end of the day, more of you will be members of Justice. As Andrea said, it comes cheap at the bargain price of 15 quid a year, and for which you pay for nice things like a building for which, in which we live, and salaries for people like me, Andrea, Jodie, and some of her interns who are now paid. Hopefully, at some point in the future, you might join their cadre. But how do we work? Well, we work, as you know, if you've read any of our materials, on the justice system. That sounds like a bit of a no-brainer, but, you know, justice works for the justice system. We work to try and make criminal, civil and administrative justice work better for us all and to protect the individual rights of people in the UK within those systems. Pretty simple. 
But what do we do and how do we do it? Well, the first of our kinds of work that we do is research and innovation. What does that mean? We're not academics. We look to try to identify difficult legal problems and suggest some solutions. Now, one part of that work historically was we looked at the arguments around, for example, a Bill of Rights for Britain. And we said what we thought about it. And our answer was there didn't seem to be much call for it, really. <laughs> and if it did happen, it would look an awful lot like the Human Rights Act. That was in 2007, before the last election. This year, we're working on a project called Delivering Justice in an Age of Austerity. Any of you who've had the good fortune to meet Rucci, um, who I think might not be in the room at the minute, but Rucci is working incredibly hard to publish this report in April. Watch this space. It's our recommendations for how you can improve access to justice in a world where legal aid aside, we know that's all very problematic and we're working to challenge the cuts. Legal aid aside, most people aren't able to afford a lawyer. So how do you make the civil courts work more effectively in a way that you can access them without having to have specialist advice? And how do you make specialist advice easier to access? So watch this space. That's been Rucci's year. Please, if you, you know, want to give her a vote of sympathy and encouragement, I'm sure she'd really appreciate it. <coughs> Secondly, we work with Westminster and Whitehall. You look on our website, click on our work, it'll drop down, you'll see briefings and consultations. <coughs> they aren't just to let our membership know what we think. They're to talk directly to decision makers. They're trying in a small way to talk about very complex legal issues and ideas to lawyers and non-lawyers, both in Whitehall and in Westminster. And some of the key challenges we've had this year have been in the Criminal Justice and Courts Act. Part four of the act makes some, we think, pretty damaging changes to the procedure for judicial review. There are four things in it. The first, it changes <coughs> the circumstances when a court will have to kick out a case because it will make, um, it's highly likely, in inverted commas, that it will make no substantial difference to the person making the claim in the case. Now, there are a number of reasons, you can read our briefing, why that will be problematic in practice. <coughs> Secondly, it creates new financial disclosure mechanisms for anybody who wants to bring a judicial review. Again, we think that will have a chilling effect on the ability of people to hold government to account in practice. Thirdly, and importantly for justice, because we work actively on interventions in our courts and at Strasbourg, Thirdly, they are going to ch it changes the rules on costs for those who are making interventions in our domestic courts at any level below the Supreme Court. At the minute, if you're a public body and you want to help the court because you think you have expertise or evidence that might assist them in a case, but you're not attached to either of the parties, you make an application to intervene. And at the minute, the presumption is, if the court thinks you're helpful and they invite you in by giving you permission, you bear your own costs, but you can recover no costs against the other side. Equally, they can recover no costs against you. So you proceed on the basis of a relatively quantifiable degree of risk. What the Act does is reverse that process and suggest that in certain criteria, which are relatively broad and <coughs> untested, the court will have a duty to award costs against any interveners. Now, given that many interveners are public, I'm um, sorry, third sector agencies and like justice charities, that can create some difficulties for boards. If they don't know what the risk is, it's very difficult for them to take it on and stay within the bounds of their charitable obligations. We think that's going to be detrimental, not just to justice's work, but to the court's ability to see that bigger picture, to be helped in its approach to cases which are perhaps constitutionally difficult, but which, where there's no real interest in either of the parties putting particular material before the court, 
which helps them not decide their case, but take a decision which is constitutionally proper and helpful in a wider sense. And finally, on protective costs orders, which is an order that allows the court to make a preemptive order at the start of a case to help a person who might otherwise withdraw their litigation because the risk is too high. That's now put on a statutory footing. And unfortunately, in a judicial review case, the court will no longer have the power to make an order at the outset, but only after someone gets permission. Now, that's, we think, also going to deter some people from being able to pursue judicial review cases. Um, finally, Counterterrorism and Security Act, which I'm sure you've seen, went through very quickly. It was introduced in November, it was passed in February. It deals with all these very high profile issues around um, people who've gone to Syria and to other countries, coming back to the UK, where the, the government thinks that there's a risk to the public interest in their return. Um, <coughs> there are a number of other measures in there. Um, reintroducing to the power uh, of the Secretary of State in connection with terrorism prevention investigation measures, orders, TPIMS, reintroducing a power of relocation, for example. That means that if somebody is subject to this administrative order which is placed on uh, individuals that the Secretary of State believes to be a terrorist suspect, the, the, ter the Secretary of State will now have the power to relocate them from their home up to 200 miles away anywhere in the United Kingdom. That, imagine, is one of the more controversial elements of the controls, uh, act, sorry, control orders regime, principally, not least, principally and not least because of the impact on the individual's family. If you can imagine your dad moving 200 miles away and thinking, well, your mum's going to take you too, um, but you're going to leave your school uh, go into a new school, you're not going to see anybody again for as long as the order's in place. Just imagine how isolating that would be, not just for the individual subject to the order, but everybody connected to them. And it will give you a flavour of why that was one of the more objectionable parts of the control orders regime. It went, but now it's back again. And finally, third party interventions. We've talked a little about interventions in the context of the Criminal Justice and Courts Act. But third party interventions, we have had a number going this year, I think we've had around five. Um, Bell Hadge is one of the more high profile, and that's a case involving um, a claim uh, on a number of common law grounds by a former dissident in the Gaddafi regime who alleges that he was rendered to torture um, and is seeking compensation from the UK government and named UK officials for their involvement and facilitation in his rendition. Now, what are we getting involved? We are a charity that looks at the justice system in the UK. Why are we caring about the rendition? Why we're engaged is because the claim was struck out um, at the High Court because the government argued two points. One that state immunity would bar a cause of action because we'd have to impute some form of illegality on the US and a number of other states. And secondly, and part more importantly, because I don't think the state immunity argument is very strong, nor did the High Court or the Court of Appeal. Secondly, it was an argument around a common law doctrine, not a doctrine of international law like state immunity, <laughs> reflects in the State Immunity Act, a common law doctrine called Foreign Act of State Doctrine. It's a doctrine which is only really recognised here in the, and in the US. And it's about a degree of reticence for domestic courts and their engagement in accepting jurisdiction in cases where they will have to deal with the activities of a third state. Now, the interpretation of this um, provision that the government and the respondent officials in this act, uh, case are arguing for is something that justice has real concerns about. Because if it is read as broadly as, as being argued, it would effectively mean that in any case where you're alleging torture or some other form of ill treatment relying on domestic causes of action, if you allege that there's a third party state involved, no matter how, 
in your case, there's a clear line for the respondent government to argue <coughs> that the courts have no jurisdiction. Now, if that's a policy that applies in the UK, and it's a policy that then applies in the US, we're giving a great deal of inspiration to other countries to undermine the prohibition on torture and all the provisions allied to that in UNCAP, UN Convention Against Torture, which provide for redress for individuals who have been subject to precisely that kind of ill treatment. And we don't want the development of our common law, which supports our justice system and access to civil courts, to be developed in that way, which is, in our view, a little bit insidious. So, I said I'd give you a run through some of what we think are some of the top cases of the year. This is going to be the quickest run through you're ever going to hear. And it's really just a reading list because we've got Raju at the back, Andrea at the back, some of our other lawyers are still here. This is my list. I haven't showed it to anybody else, so we can probably have an argument about whether I've got it right or not. Um, I did talk to Jodie because I thought she should at least have some input on what I thought was the big criminal case of the year. But let's go through them. <laughs> Nick Clinson, if you haven't read it, go and read it. It's desperately long. Like, it's, it's not just a, I'm going to read it on the bus on my way to lectures. If you read it on the bus on the way to lectures, you will cry before you get off the bus. <laughs> you will cry and think, I'm a bad lawyer. I don't understand. I should never be doing this course. Sit down, get a cold towel, a cup of tea, commit yourself to it for the afternoon and you'll discover that you're interested in the law, if you're as much of a law geek as I am. There's things to agree with it in it, there's things to disagree with it in it, but it's not just about, as everybody says, that's the end of life case. Ooh. What it is, if you read it carefully, is a great exploration of how the courts understand their obligations under the Human Rights Act. You've got a number of different judges approaching the obligations under Section 3 and Section 4 differently. And they come to different conclusions, but there's a broad stream, in my view, that runs through each of their judgments of deep respect for the parliamentary process and a deep respect for the intention that the Human Rights Act was designed to create a tripartite responsibility across government, a constitutional recognition that there are differing functions for the judiciary and for our legislature. And it's a really interesting read that I wish that those who are drafting the Conservative uh, draft bill on human rights or draft bill on rights and responsibilities or whatever it's going to be called would sit down and read <laughs> because I think they'd find it very hard to put pen to paper and again try and criticise the fact that they believe that the Human Rights Act is allowing our judiciary to use up parliamentary sovereignty. Cheshire West and P. Now Cheshire West and P is a case about Article 5 and how we interpret Article 5 and the right to liberty as applied to persons who lack capacity, legal capacity, usually people who've got very severe learning disabilities or older people who have di dementia and who are living in care. And an earlier case that some of you may remember called uh, Bornwood at Strasbourg held that Article 5 did apply in those circumstances and you had to have safeguards in place to ensure that people were not de being deprived, to, deprived of their liberty unlawfully. Now we have a system in the UK called deprivation of liberty safeguards which everybody thinks doesn't work very well. Um, it's been reviewed by the Law Commission, it's been reviewed by various other people and it definitely is in desperate need of reform. Now this case was about, and I'm not going to go into it in any great detail, was about how Article 5 should mean that the deprivation of liberty <coughs> dolls system should be interpreted. And the court the Supreme Court held that yes, as everybody suspected, the Dawes regime was not being applied in a way which was consistent and um, compatible with Article 5. So local authorities have had to change their procedures. But what's really interesting about this case is some real statements about the universal nature of human rights. 
If you're a human rights defender and you're getting engaged in the debate about the Human Rights Act and who it serves, read this judgment. I'm not going to say it often because I say it too often, but read Brenda Hale's contribution. She talks very strongly and very passionately about the universal nature of human rights and why the human rights frameworks, wherever they lie, are there to protect us all. Um, that might be one for our colleague's taxi driver that he was talking about this morning. Guardian News and Media versus A, B and C, D. Now, the names in this case um, are now public. I can't remember what they, are, they were. I did try and get Jodie before she ran out the door to remind me. I apologise. Um, this is the case at the Court of Appeal, um, which was about secret criminal trials. And I know that sounds very sensationalist and very Daily Mail, but if we're really honest, that's what it was about. It was about the, um, a criminal judge, a trial judge, taking a determination that the bulk of a criminal trial would take place in camera, behind closed doors. And now, it was particularly sensational for justice because we had to keep telling journalists why in camera was different to closed material procedures. And, um, that really did burn some journalists' minds, particularly because they would then say it's different. So does that mean justice doesn't care? It's like, no, they're different, but they're equally damaging for different reasons. Oh, there were some exploding journalists' minds in, in the office the, after the afternoon that they tried to talk to us about this. But in, the long and the short of it being that, yes, of course, there will be cases where some parts of the evidence in a criminal trial is incredibly sensitive and there might be a public interest in some parts of a trial being closed. Not to the defendant, but to the press. That's something that's been long-standing and accepted and there's procedures for balancing whether an Article 6 compliant trial can take place with part of the trial being closed. This was one of the first cases where the trial judge was pretty much saying none of this is going to be subject to public scrutiny ever. Full stop. There will be a criminal trial in the UK that takes place which says nothing. Nobody will know. There will be no reporters. Beyond the people who've been convicted, nobody will know what they've been convicted of and why. I beg the question whether that would stand once they got to prison and perhaps told their colleagues what had happened. But this was in principle what the trial judge wanted to say. And the Guardian, um, and supported by another, a number of other news outlets, <coughs> took this to the Court of Appeal to challenge the trial directions. And it was quite an important case. Um, and the, the media across the piece, for obvious reasons, got engaged in it. Um, and quite importantly, they were relying on the Human Rights Act. Yes, those would be outlets like the Daily Mail and the Telegraph pointing out how unfair it would be for the press to be excluded from this trial. Not least would it be an Article 6 problem for the individual concerned, because obviously Article 6 says when you have a criminal trial, it should be open. It would be an Article 10 issue, because as the press, the fourth pillar, they serve an amazing public responsibility to ensure that we're all engaged and informed about the role of the prosecution and blah, blah, blah. So do read this. Uh, what happened was the Court of Appeal said, yes, we accept that this is an incredibly sensitive case, but no, sorry, trial judge, you can't say everything is automatically closed. In fact, what we're going to do is create some form of mechanism, which means that the press can be cleared. You know the press. They can sit in. They can be subject to substantial reporting restrictions. We can set reporting restrictions, which mean that the trial isn't necessarily reported until it's complete or until a point when it's safe. For example, if it's a concern that's about tampering with witnesses, we can delay the reporting, but you can't close it completely. Now, we might have disagreements about how that model will work in practice, but it has to be far preferable to a trial judge simply saying, the doors are closed once and for all. Now, Kennedy and the Charity Commission, I'm having to hurry now. Um, Kennedy and the Charity Commission, uh, it's a case about um, uh, challenging a decision of the Charity Commission to refuse to release information under the Freedom of Information Act. I'm not going to tell you anything more about it. It's really important 
because it's one of the central cases following one from Osborne last year and succeeded by an important case called Carlisle, uh, where you see the judges saying, hang on a minute, you're running this as a Human Rights Act case. Why? You've got the common law. The common law is at least as good and at least as helpful as the Human Rights Act. Dummies, haven't you even thought that you could try the common law first? In fact, that's pretty much what, there's a three paragraph judgment, part of the judgment in Lord Tolson's analysis in Kennedy and Lord Mans, I think Lord Mans, I can't remember, Mans and Tolson, I think. If you read it, basically that's what they're saying. You've all forgotten about the common law since you got this newfangled Human Rights Act. Oh, it's feeling a bit neglected. We wouldn't, and there's lots of people who will speculate about whether the newfound resurgence of the common law is influenced by the wider political debate. And at Justice, we have pointed out that there are clear limits, not least there's been another case this year called Michael's, which was about Article 2 obligations, which we've been talking about today, and whether or not Article 2 obligations can get you a remedy where negligence couldn't. And that's what the Supreme Court said. In that case of Michael's, it was a family looking to seek redress for <coughs> a failure of the police to respond to a call from their um, family member who'd said her, her boyfriend was coming to kill her. And they had a record that he had threatened to kill her before, and there was clear evidence of domestic violence that something went wrong, the police did not attend, and she died. Now, they wanted to sue in negligence, and they wanted to sue under the Human Rights Act. Got to the Supreme Court, guess what? To sue in the Human Rights Act claim, but actually we're going to confirm that you can have no duty of care on the police in these circumstances which would get you a remedy in negligence. So next time somebody tells you the Human Rights Act doesn't get you anything that the common law wouldn't, tell them to go and read Michael's. All right? That's my sceptical point about Kennedy. But anybody who's engaged in the debate needs to read Kennedy and needs to read Carlisle to understand about what the judges are saying about should you not have a Human Rights Act claim, what will the common law get you? <coughs> and the last one's a cheat, because it was top of the pop, so I was going to give you five, but actually it's three. And, and I'm not going to go through all of them. It's about a theme, and it's austerity and justice. There's a whole range of cases in the last 12 months. You'd have had to have been in a hole to have missed them. Um, about challenges to government decisions associated and allied to the cuts. Now, I've got these three here um, to prove a point, and I think it's a good point. The Bedroom Act cases, uh, sorry, Bedroom Tax cases have been the most high profile challenges under the cuts. There have been others made to library closures and uh, withdrawal of services in other areas. This is a bedroom tax case, and I've only picked it because it's one of the most high profile. And they've been routinely unsuccessful so far, beyond a handful of cases. Um, they're becoming, I think, slightly more high profile. Look again at the Independent Living Fund challenge, which has succeeded, I think, at this stage. It's still in its way, making its way through the, the, the Courts of Appeal. Um, but the first two, are two of a, a whole range. We, we talked in my breakout about LETS, which is the legal aid and inquests challenge, where the courts have been much more willing to act. And these are cases which involve challenges to the government's restrictions on legal aid. And it's, they're willing to look in, I think, proper detail in an area where they have expertise and ask, have the government acted consistently with their policy and in a manner which is consistent with Article 6? It's worth a read and it's worth bearing in mind when people say to you, oh, none of these, none of these cuts challenges are succeeding. Uh, or somebody says to you, are oh, these legal aid challenges, it's the judges sticking their nose in where they're, they're not really wanted. If you ever get somebody saying that to you, so you'd ask them to draw that comparison between the judge's approach to cases in areas outside their expertise, where they might be taking a lighter touch approach, to those cases where they're being asked to 
assess the impact of changes to practice and procedure as a, as a result of austerity within the justice system. And ask yourself, those of us who are old, old enough to remember sort of pre-Human Rights Act public law, way back when, um, you remember actually the nuance there was often in re resource cases where the government would say there might be circumstances where we have particular expertise to bring to bear where we might be willing to exercise a closer look. I mean, you only have to look at a very important case called Witham to say, even there, back in the 80s, 90s, they were willing to say, if you go too far and you cut too hard or you increase the fees too much, topical question, we might be willing to step in to preserve the integrity of the justice system. So that's my top of the pops. There are three Strasbourg ones, two from this year you need to look at. You, you probably know them already. Hutchinson is about uh, whole life tariffs. Strasbourg thinks again. McHugh is prisoners votes. Prisoners votes, still unlawful. We're still in violation of the convention, but no, there won't be any compensation. And finally, Digital Rights Ireland, which isn't a Strasbourg case, it's a Court of Justice, the European Union case, which says that the European Data Retention Directive is incompatible with the Charter for the Fundamental, sorry, European Union Charter for Protection <coughs> of Fundamental Rights. It's an incredibly important case, and it's one that will be very important as we come to look at the legality of the UK's framework for surveillance. Unfortunately, it's a case which the government doesn't appear to have read. It introduces a response in, a, in an act called the Data Retention and Investigation of something. But the acronym is DRIPA, uh, which was an emergency legislation which was said to respond to Digital Rights Ireland, which, if anybody's read both, you might think that it's the government saying, well, Yabu sucks to you. Um, we, we get that you don't think our um, legislation is clear or incorporates any safeguards, but we're going to implement it in pretty much the same way as we had it before, but instead of in this piece of statutory um, uh, delegated legislation, we're going to put it in primary legislation, because that's all right, because Parliament's sovereign, so, so that's fine. But we'll come and look at it again in 2016, so watch this space. Ah, as Leslie reminded you this morning, you cannot have a human rights talk in 2015 without talking about Magna Carta. That's Magna Carta. Um, so 2015, I gave this talk in 2013 and I said, what's 2015? Birthday of Magna Carta. And of course, we're going to have the Bill of Rights debate because the Tories are going to put it in their manifesto. Ah, look, Crystal Drum, we're here. Um, so what do the Tories really say? I'm going to take five minutes. I'm going to rush through it. I'm not going to have any nuance because I don't think that there is any. Um, <laughs> <coughs> Strategy proposal, I've stuck it in blue just so that you know it's not Justice's strategy proposal. Um, and a response. The, the main thrust of the, the Tory paper is that they want to reinstate parliamentary sovereignty. What's the answer? It didn't go away! <laughs> We've just talked about the judges. See sections 2, 3, 4, 6 of the HRA if you want any proof. Take or leave it the advice of the ECTHR in their judgments. Well, what does Article 46 say? Article 46 says, says we've got an international obligation to abide by the rules, <laughs> sorry, the judgments of the Strasbourg Court. That's what, it's an international obligation. There's nothing that forces Parliament to change the law. The judgment in the prisoners' voting case was in 2005. How many prisoners... Has vo have voted since 2005. Any? Nah. So Parliament's felt so, so beleaguered to implement this proposal that, that no, nothing's changed. Well, that's because it illustrates the nature of the difference in a dualist state like the UK between domestic law and international law. And what the Convention does is it creates a political and diplomatic process for securing the implementation of its judgments. Who secures compliance with Article 46? 
Do you think it's the European Court of Human Rights? Could be, but in practice, it's actually the foreign ministers of Europe. Ah, wonder if William Hague has told David Cameron that that's how it works. Maybe. But actually, the main problem with this, from a justice perspective, is this is an international obligation. It's generally accepted that the Convention works really well because of the framework within which we try and enforce its obligation. <coughs> now, if we start saying we'll only pick and choose which ones we like and we don't like, that means so does Russia. So we say we don't like prisoners' votes. Russia says we don't like treating prisoners nicely, <laughs> or journalists, or protesters, because that's not consistent with the Russian ethos. And if that falls down in Europe, where it's supposed to be the most evolved human rights mechanism, what does that do for the UN model? What does that do for the ICCPR? What does that do for UNCAS? If it's good for us, it's good for Russia, it's good for Beijing, and it's good for Tehran. And I think that's a message that anybody, either in the Conservatives or UKIP, <coughs> needs to be ready to grapple with. No remedy in trivial cases. Only proper human rights. Proper. Who do you want to decide that it's a proper and serious case for determination? Ditto. If we get to decide which cases we think are capable of judicial determination <coughs> at home or abroad, so does Russia, so does Beijing, so does Tehran. Do you really want that to be the international picture? Do you want to unpick the international framework for minimum standards on human rights? We might sound like we're being alarmist. We're really not. The Kenyan president used the Conservative Party proposal on human rights as an argument about why it was entirely legitimate for the Kenyans not to cooperate with the International Criminal Court. It's easily Googled. I challenge you to do it. And amending the ministerial code. This sounds really dull. It's something nobody's really noticed in the proposals. There's a throwaway line that says <coughs> they will amend the ministerial code to make it clear that ministers' first and foremost duty is to Parliament. Well, any minister who thought that wasn't the case probably is a bit misguided. But what that really means is getting rid of the bit in the ministerial code which says that ministers are to assume that the UK intends to comply with its international obligations. Now, that's really important because what's good in the Human Rights Act isn't just all the stuff about what courts and lawyers and what we do in our day to day. It's about that tripartite responsibility, that sharing of responsibility on human rights. Section 6 of the Human Rights Act says every public authority, every public authority has to act consistently with convention rights. That creates a great lever for advocacy, for better practice in good government. <coughs> Section 10, we'll skip it. Section 19, ministers have a responsibility to de declare to Parliament that every piece of legislation either is or is not intended to be compatible with the Convention. That then creates a great hook for the Joint Committee on Human Rights or individual parliamentarians to ask ministers to show them your homework. If you think it's responsible and you want so compatible and you want it to be compatible, tell me why you think it is. That's what section 19 gets you. If you take away all of that what seems to be treated in the conservative paper as periphery, you ignore all these <laughs> important constitutional, I'd say, changes that the Human Rights Act has instigated. But if we go beyond the debate, <coughs> what are we going to get in 2015? They don't, in the draft bill that we haven't seen yet, talk about the EU. They don't talk about devolution. They don't talk about the common law. They don't recognise that this year we're about, next at the end of the month, to get another Council of Europe declaration on how you implement the Convention about the importance of national measures for um, implementation. That will be the Brussels declaration. 
And they don't talk about the fact that at the end of the year, we'll have a, new, a big um, Council of Europe exercise coming to fruition where all the nations of the Council of Europe are coming together to reflect on how to secure the future of the Convention. But between now and a new Bill of Rights, there stands the ballot box and the dispatch box. And there are lots of MPs and peers of many different colours who see the value of the Human Rights Act. What will be the question is whether they see the value of rational debate or the power of the whip. Now, other things we should run through, because it's not going to be all about the Bill of Rights stuff. Andrea knows this. We are setting our budget for 2015 to 2016, and we're setting our plans. If all we did was talk about the Human Rights Act, we'd probably grind to a halt. Um, there might be a Data Retention and Investigatory Powers Act 2060. They've got to replace RIPA with something. You've seen the ISC conclusion. The powers are okay, but they need to be a bit more transparent. Really? Um, we might have a Counter-Terrorism Security and Borders Act. Philip Hammond's already said he wants new terrorism powers to be a priority. We might see a new criminal procedure as a result of the Le Levison reforms. And the last lot I've put in italics, because I can't even imagine what the case names should be and how it fit them in. But I suspect that these last four cases, the, 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 the cuts to the legal aid system, are all going to get to the Supreme Court in the next year. Well, most of them. Most of them. Most of them, hopefully. Um, and then we've got Snowden meets Strasbourg, which is my shorthand for the two very long cases that are currently pending in Strasbourg about prism and tempora. Um, there's one that has um, Liberty leading the challenge. Sorry. And there's one which leads, is led by Big Brother Watch. Google them and you'll see. Um, but what role for justice? Well, you tell us. You're our members. Research and education will keep going, speaking to our membership and beyond, and hopefully getting you guys involved at every step of the way. Well, I spoke for longer than 40 minutes, but I'm Glaswegian, and I can probably talk the hind legs off a donkey. I'm sure Raju wouldn't mind if we sit, spend 10 minutes talking around some of the, the topics that have come up. If there's anything you want to ask, stick your hand in the air. No, but we can come back to anything that's missing after you've heard from Raju. Anybody? Just like a quick question. When you mentioned the, the role of the foreign uh, office ministers in, the, in Europe, you were talking about the Council of Ministers. Committee of Ministers, yeah. The Committee of Ministers is it's the ministers of the, all of the states of the Council of Europe, and it's their primary responsibility to provide for execution of Strasbourg judgments. So they talk to each other about how well they're executing judgment. Now that could be done better, but it does somewhat give a lie to the press headlines <laughs> about un, you know, wieldy judges in Strasbourg somehow changing our domestic processes. <coughs> Anybody else? Oh, I've killed your will to live. Raju will, I'm sure, bring it back to life. Thank you, Max.